So I'd like to welcome uh, everybody for our first panel discussion of 2022. Um, I think it's going to be really, really interesting because I think it's bringing together uh, lots of different uh, approaches to the use of technology in uh, dealing with humanitarian situations and development work. So we're really, really excited ever since uh, the pandemic. I think we've recognized that the power of technology uh, goes way beyond what we had originally thought. And uh, this is a point in hand. Here we are uh, in the middle of the day, all sitting in different parts of the world, being able to sit around a screen and sharing and creating opportunities for collaboration, working together and really making a, a, an enormous difference in the lives of women and girls. Um, I just want to say a few words about Giving Women because I think there are a few people that uh, don't know who we are. Uh, we're um, an organization that is uh, based in Switzerland, but we are now um, having members from as far as Canada um, uh, joining us. So this is really exciting and that is part of the power of technology. Uh, we're a membership of an organization of women who have come together to work on projects that are going to improve the lives of women and girls uh, in the most vulnerable communities around the world. Part of our work, we have three pillars, uh, and uh, the core of our work is working with our projects where we create project circles. But to do this work in a, the most professional way possible and with the most knowledge available, we have two subsequent pillars. One of them is our educational pillar, which is really one where we do workshops and help develop our skills in a much more technical way so we can really put uh, support the projects that we uh, help to move to the next stage. And the second, the third pillar is the one we are part of today, which is bringing awareness <coughs> around issues facing women and also the solutions uh, to those issues that women face. And one of the big uh, instigations instigators of these panel discussion is also to allow people to come together and work together. So convene as many stakeholders as possible so we can really, as a group, work together to make a difference. <laughs> Our original mantra used to be, I believe in the power of one, but we recognize that magic happens when we all get together. So I will pass on to Maria, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. And, and I would like to say a big thank, thank you to Maria Mavridoglu who's uh, organized this and is also hosting and moderating this meeting. So, and I pass it on. Oh, I, I think I left out some stuff. So one of the things we like to do is um, make this as interactive as possible. And so if you have any questions, do not hesitate to put them in the chat box. We will keep our eye on them. <coughs> and we will ask our panelists also to keep an eye on them so that you can respond when you're making your, uh, when you're speaking. Uh, Kathleen, did I forget something? No, I think that that's the, the main thing. And I'm that's it. Some, some instructions in the chat box. As we, as okay, perfect. Okay, so we pass it on to Maria now and thank you everybody for joining us. And thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Atalanti. Thank you everyone for making time this lunchtime for <coughs> our first meeting of 2022. Um, as Atalanti said, we're delighted to have with us um, a host of very interesting panelists today. Uh, all of them are pioneers and uh, innovators in your field. So thank you. And uh, definitely you're giving up a lot of your valuable time to be with us today and to share with us your experiences in, in using applications and online technology to further the causes of the organizations that, uh, that you're in. Uh, so first, I would like to start with, with saying thank you. I'm not going to go very deep into introducing each of our panelists today as everyone would have received the detailed bios uh, um, with, the, with the invitation. We have with us uh, Professor Lucy Clover from dialing in from Cape Town um, and uh, representing uh, the child and family social work uh, 
professor for the Dis Department of Social Policy and Intervention of the University of Oxford. Uh, we have Sahana Sankar from Hand in Hand India, uh, diving in from Chennai. We have Deidre Collings, um, co-founder and executive director of SecDev Foundation, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, Salamatech and what her organization does. Uh, Morgan Bonvalia from uh, Geneva, a bit closer to where I am in Zurich, uh, who will be talking to us about uh, their initiative called Stop Hate Speech. And then last but not least, um, Adereni, Dr. Adereni Abiodun calling in from Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, who'll be talking about Help Mom. He's the founder and CEO uh, of this organization. So without further ado, I, I would like to pass the first question to Lucy, uh, just to kick things off. Uh, Lucy, what was your personal motivation to further integrate the use of tech and apps within, within your respective project and organization? Would you care sharing that with us, please? Well, thank you so much, Maria and Atlanti. And, and um, it's just lovely to be joining this um this group and and thank you all for for, for coming today um you know I'm, I'm back where i was working 20 years ago as a social worker and i was working in child protection and with children orphaned by aids and now suddenly we find ourselves back in in an extraordinary situation where two things have come together at the same time the first is that families under are under extraordinary stress and we're seeing massively high increased rates of child abuse across the world as you know families parents are exhausted and stressed and dealing with bereavement and sickness but also i've been working with colleagues at the cdc and world health organization to understand about covid associated orphanhood and we actually have now, with the latest estimates, just this week have found that there are over 9 million children who've lost a parent or a primary caregiver to COVID in the last two years alone. And those children and those families desperately need support in the, in the kind of wonderful but hugely challenging process of, of bringing up a child in these difficult situations. And so what we've done is we took the parenting programs that we've developed and tested over 15 years that, that were shown to reduce child abuse and made them into mobile versions. And this means that we can now reach families who are in isolation, we can reach families in lockdown, and we can reach many, many more families for a lower cost than, than ever before. And so, you know, what I think what was necessity drove us to have to turn things into remote remote versions and and you also have to make remote versions for families who don't have wi-fi for families who have the most basic mobile phones um, you know for for families who don't have money to buy data necessity drove us but it has the potential to reach um to reach so many millions thank you very much um, for that um, so Sahana, what, what was it, what was the driving force between, behind um, the Hand in Hand India project uh, adopting mobile and application technology? Thanks Maria, and again, thanks to Atlanti and Giving Women for giving uh, Hand in Hand India, our founding organization and Hand in Hand Switzerland also an opportunity to be part of this very relevant and engaging topic. Uh, so, as you know, Hand in Hand is a not-for-profit organization, and uh, we have been adapting technology even pre-COVID into our programs. We have a five-pillar program where we work with uh, child labor elimination and education, women's empowerment and job creation, access to healthcare, skill development, and environment. And we use each of these pillars as tools to alleviate poverty. Our goal really is to create 10 million jobs for women at the bottom of the pyramid by 2025. And uh, so far we've created 4.8 million jobs. And uh, technology has very much been at the forefront spurring um, our numbers and our achievements. Hand in Hand Switzerland focuses on education, empowerment and environment. And as an entity based in Geneva, we focus on knowledge sharing and advocacy with key stakeholders. And we're looking forward to advancing the use of technology with our partners in Switzerland and across the world. 
we have uh, developed a couple of mobile applications that uh, have really helped women scale their enterprises and reach out to more markets uh, through mobile applications and business to business technologies. We've also integrated um, technology, especially during COVID, uh, to bring education to rural girls since schools have been shut in India for close to two years and it's been a very evident and tangible digital divide. So we have been using digital technology uh, and infrastructure to bring schools to children over the last two years um, as well, in addition to many other projects that, that, that we do. Thanks a lot, uh, Sahana. Um, I guess when we think about uh, the adoption of mobile apps, I mean, we're all, uh, we're in a privileged position um, in most of the countries that we're based in to have very strong internet penetration. The global internet penetration rate is 59%, 95% of that is, is via mobile devices. And then in Northern Europe, where most, uh, of, the, the, of most of us are based, it's 95%, which is very high. Um, however, that may not be the case in certain war-torn areas, uh, or that may be the only way by, by which um, a, a certain individual can access information or their family or, or rather crucial resources. So Deirdre, would you mind telling us a bit uh, about your personal motivation in integrating um, technology in the work of SecDev and Salamatech in the areas that you operate? Uh, thanks so much, Maria, and really I'm very honored to be here with you today. Um, so all of the work that we do at the SecDev Foundation has a very uh, central online dimension. Uh, and it is for the reasons that I've heard from the, the other, our, my fellow two panelists so far, uh, both in terms of its ability to uh, reach those who are unreachable, uh, with adaptations uh, sometimes necessary, uh, but also because of the uh, multiplier effect in terms of the many, many, many more people that you have the potential to reach, especially these days where just about everybody is leapfrogging onto a digital device. So today I'm talking to you, going to share some of uh, our work specifically on online gender-based violence and what motivates us there, myself and my teams, to be integrating technology at the heart of that is first of all, the scale of the problem of online gender-based violence, um, the enormity of the response that's needed and the multiplier effects that technology brings to our work. Um, for a little bit of context, uh, some of you may have heard about the tragic suicide a few weeks ago of Basant Khaled, a 17-year-old girl in Egypt. She took her own life after two young men photoshopped her pictures and posted them on Facebook. One of the perpetrators had sent Bassant a malicious link, which when she clicked it, let him access her private personal photos. Bassant left a note for her mother. Mom, the letter said, I hope you understand that I am not this girl. These photos are fake, I swear to God. Another example comes from our own work in Syria. Sarah, a young woman who was learning how to become a hairdresser for economic independence and used her phone to take photos of her new modeling hairstyles, uncovered of course. Her phone was not password protected. When she lost it, her personal photos were then used to blackmail her and she eventually had to leave her family, her community and her village. Sarah and Basant are just two of the growing number of victims of what we call technology assisted violence against women. And while this problem is growing everywhere, its consequences can be especially horrific in some of the places where we work, regions within Syria, the Middle East and North Africa, where patriarchal norms um, exert significant controls over women's online, sorry, women's freedoms and behaviors writ large. Um, our field teams see enormous violence and harm happening daily to women and girls from incidents that start online with consequences ranging from blackmail to divorce to expulsion to honor killings. And what motivates us is that we know that so much of this harm can be prevented if women and their families were empowered with basic digital safety information and knowledge and training. Had Sarah's phone been password protected, she would probably still be with her family. Had Basant known never to click on links, the outcomes might have been different. So a whole lot of our frontline work is done by teams on the ground, but the online dimension, the public agile campaigns and resources are absolutely critical for reaching 
more women, more girls, and also the organizations that help those women and girls. So it's a technology, it's a multiplier effect for us that is, is the, the, the key to technological integration. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that and um, the, these extremely uh, horrifying stories and hopefully the work of organizations such as yours can help alleviate that um, danger, I would say. Um, to keep the, the, the topic on online, um, possible online threats and hate speech, um, I would like to go to, to pass the baton to Morgan uh, since uh, her organization is um, similar to what you do, but more focused on the online aspect of, um, of, of hate speech. And that, that can often be the beginning, I would say, of gender-based uh, violence or otherwise. So Morgan, over to you. Yes, um, well, thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, so the, the, pro the, the problem of gender-based violence and violence in general um, in social media, um, is um, something that we are all um, very aware of. And um, as the umbrella organization of uh, women's societies in Switzerland, uh, we were very concerned um, about the impact of hate speech and violence um, um, against women online, um, because those impacts were really uh, everywhere in women's life. Um, and for example, hateful, we realized that, that hateful comments uh, online would make a woman especially public figure as such as a journalist or a politician uh, to leave social media platforms. For example, on Twitter, there is a very huge gap between the male and the female uh, users, um, which is already um, um, very, um, it's, it's, it's a very worried um, phenomenon. Uh, but also those uh, figures, for example, um, a lot of politician women in Switzerland would um, also um, actually withdraw from their position uh, in order to avoid um, such a violence. Uh, which is um, in our position of the, the voice of uh, political voice of women in Switzerland was uh, truly a threat to democracy and to equality. Um, so we needed to find solution against that. And um, since it's such a huge and, and um, impressive phenomenon, I would say, uh, we decided we, we needed to find um, ways to make it, let's say, um, um, smaller. So we wanted to tackle this phenomenon on a very local way. And in order to be truly efficient, then we needed tools and um, we needed for, we decided to uh, develop an algorithm to really help um, the society to react, but with the help of um, technology. Thank you. So, so if, if I understand correctly, then it's through uh, the social um, civil society engagement that your organization hopes to leverage technology in order to bring people together and help alleviate. Um, exactly, for us, the, the danger the yeah. that is posed through hate speech online. Yeah, all right, yeah, exactly. We'll make the, society, the civil society work with technology in order to be more efficient against um, the, the the phenomenon in a very um, practical ways. We have an algorithm that spot hateful mm -hmm. comments on Swiss social medias and platform and media platforms, and then the, 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 the civil society can react on it. And we Understood. train our uh, community to react on hate, hateful comments. But it's only possible because uh, we have this algorithm. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. And. Um... Last but not least, um, I guess, to, to shift gears and to go to uh, Lagos, Nigeria, uh, Adereni, uh, we've got Dr. Abiodun Adereni uh, joining us. Um, and uh, I would love to hear from you a bit on your personal motivation, just to take it back a notch before we go in deep into the weeds of what your organization does. Um, what was it? that motivated you to integrate mobile technologies uh, within Help Mom's work. Would you share your journey with us, please? Yeah, so thank you very much for this great opportunity and thank you to the Giving Women team. 
And also shout out to um, our board of advisor, Corinne, that is on the call also here. Yeah. Um, so basically, when, when I started Help Mom, essentially, what I was very passionate about was to tackle maternal and infant mortality using the community-based approach. So the community-based approach was that we will go to oral communities, um, provide free healthcare information, um, provide free healthcare checkups and the likes for them. So when I was doing that, I saw that how many communities do we want to visit that we can, we can we'll be able to reach out to a lot of people at the same time. And the best way to reach out to a lot of people is using technology. Technology is a catalyst for scaling. So that was one of the reasons why we incorporated great technology into what we do. Just to give an overview of what we do at Help Mom, um, Nigeria is the second largest contributor to maternal mortality in the world and the largest contributor to infant mortality in the world. And the thing about this is that um, most of this maternal and infant mortality death can be preventable. So what we do at Help Mom is providing solutions that actually prevent maternal and infant mortality in remote rural areas in Nigeria. So we have product and services. So we have something called the Help Mom Clean Bed Kit. The Clean Bed Kit contains all the essential items a mother in a rural community can use to have safe delivery in her home without, even if she doesn't have a um, medical clinic in our community. You can be able to use our clean bed kit to have a safe delivery. We have something called the Help Mom Vaccination Tracking System. At the moment, Nigeria is the one of the lowest country in the world with the lowest immunization, is one of the countries in the world with the lowest immunization rate. So what we do at Help Mom basically is very, very simple. We have this vaccination tracking system that we use to track immunizations in rural communities where we send them reminders and also provide the closest vaccine center that they can take their children for in their own local dialect. The other thing we do is that we have, we created the first ever e-learning platform for community health workers in Nigeria. It's very simple. What we do is that we have, is on our website, we have these short, short videos where community health workers can self-train themselves if they are faced with any challenges when they're having delivery in a rural community, they can use those videos to avert any form of maternal mortality. So to aid that, we know that most of them, they have basic phone. They don't have a smartphone to access our content. We started giving out free mobile tablets with our content on it. So they can use those content to save life on the spot and they don't need a Wi-Fi or internet connection to access it. And now with the our before we launch our e-learning platform, when we are always going to have deliveries, when we are always going to have trainings of traditional birth attendants and community health workers, we could not reach out to a lot of people at once. But with our e-learning platform, thousands and thousands of community health workers across southwestern part of Nigeria are using it daily to save the lives of mothers and to avert maternal and infant mortality. The last thing we do is uh, we go to condemn maternity homes, condemn maternity homes in rural communities and we renovate it. What we do here is that we give them the opportunity a mother, like a mother in the urban community we have to have the safe bath. So what we do essentially is that we renovate it, we provide hospital bed, we provide, um, we provide roofing, we provide, we change the facilities and we give them that kind of experience the mother in the urban, world, urban area will have access to. So. For the Help, Help Mom Digital Health Cafe, we've only done one, and we are looking at actually scaling this across Nigeria. But for our vaccination tracking system, we have over 60,000 nursing mothers registra registered on it, and now we are helping them to prevent their children from any form of vaccine-related death. And for, for our e-learning platform, we have close to 2,000 traditional birth attendants and community health workers using it daily to save the life of pregnant women on this spot. And also our clean bite kit also has been, has been able to have over more than 200 communities rich also. We've been able to see that technology is a very important tool to scale. Before, when we were using community-based approach of going to communities to have just to provide free healthcare services, just to provide health information, it was hard for us to scale because how many communities do we have to physically go to to provide all these things? But the moment we incorporated 
technology into what we do, we've been able to scale our work that we don't even need any physical presence to be anywhere for anybody to have access to our vaccination tracking system, for anybody to have access to our e-learning platform for community health workers. So I've seen that technology is a great catalyst. And that's what I tell everybody that for any, everything you do, technology helps you amplify and scale your impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adarani, for sharing that. I think it's absolutely true and it's echoed, I think, throughout um, all of our panelists, uh, brief, brief descriptions of what their organizations do, that technology aids with scale. Uh, what I would like to ask uh, each and every one of you, and maybe we can, we can start off with you, uh, Abiodun, since you just spoke, is, do, do you believe that apart from the scaling, there's also a qualitative enhancement via the adoption of applications or technology through your organization? Do the users become um, more engaged with the solutions that you offer? Do they learn more or more in greater depth or in, have a, a bigger engagement, I would say, over time, uh, as opposed to just getting more people access to, to what, uh, what the solution is. Thank you. The very important thing people must understand is that when you are creating, tech, when you are creating solutions, technology solutions for people, especially people that stay in remote communities, you must be able to create it in their local context and you must be able to make it very simple and easy to use. And that is the most important thing. The, the, the thing is this, we, before we create any solution, any technology solution for the target um, population that we deal with, we talk to them first to understand how can we make this thing we are creating beneficial to you. And the first thing I've come to realize is that you must, any technology you are creating for people in the remote communities, you must first make it very easy for them to understand. That means it must be in their local language context. It must be in their local language. Um, it must be something that they understand. Because one of the things I've come to realize is that a lot of people create technology solutions for a target population that don't understand what the technology is all about. The technology is amazing, but this target population don't understand it. So there's no synergy between that. So what we've come to do at Elpon first is that we understand the people we want to take, we want to actually solve a problem for, then we go back on our own end to create a solution in which they will understand. So if you notice, if you go to our e-learning platform for instance now, it's on our website, you can click on it. You, might, you won't understand the language actually because it is the language is actually in Yoruba. It's an indigenous language they speak and they understand. So if you go to the website and you go to our e-learning, you just see it. You might just click on it, but you won't understand the language because it's in their local context. So the mm -hmm. what I've come to realize is that if you want to create solution for people in rural communities, first solve the language barrier. Mm -hmm. The second thing I've come to realize also is that don't let us, I, I won't, I won't, um, I won't, I won't romanticize this. People in rural communities, the mobile adoption is still very low. So a lot of them don't have smartphones. That is just the truth. So a lot of them use basic phones. And that's one of the reasons why when we were doing our help mom vaccination tracking system, we decided that we're not going to create an app because it is useless for them. So what we decided was that we have to send them this messaging in, in their own basic phone that they can read and understand. So our mobile app, our Vaccination tracking system is not an app. It's just a system where we register and send reminders to people on their basic phone. So, so most of SMS. the time, the SMS, yes. Message. Text messages, yes. Yeah. So most of the time I've come to realize that most people create interesting and beautiful solution in app for a target population that stay in rural community that don't have a smartphone. So it is very important you understand that creating a app solution for people in rural community will never work, mm -hmm. no matter how interesting the solution is. So what we do is that for our vaccination tracking system, we use SMS to get across to them because we know they have basic mm -hmm. phone. Understood. But if you look at, for our e-learning platform, it was a different approach. They can't, you can't access videos on basic phone. So what we did was that we had to look for partners. So we partnered with um, Facebook Meta, their current call Meta. So they gave the sponsored um, they gave us funding to buy mobile tablets. 
So on the mobile tablet, we put all the content of our e-learning platforms on it, whereas where you don't need an internet or Wi-Fi connection to access it, then we gave it out to this rural community women and we taught them how to use it. And let me tell you the beautiful thing that has been happening from this. These rural women now take this mobile tablet and they are like um, help mom trainers. They take this mobile child tablet to have community engagement with other traditional bath attendants and community health workers to train them on how they can use the content of our um, e-learning platform. And also they use those content also to save life on the spot because they don't need Wi-Fi and they don't need internet connectivity. So what yeah. am I saying again? So it's about, this if, I, if I may pause you, so just so that we, we understand it, basically the way that I see it is creating a hybrid and a tailored solution depending on your intended audience so that you can reach out and impact and, and be able to um, become relevant to as many people as possible and being yes, able to recognize yes. that not everyone has access to the same resources, which, uh, which brings me to a question that I wanted to ask Lucy actually about um, the, the insights that she and her project might have had on, on that regard with, with respect to the parenting app. Uh, because as far as I understand, it was primarily launched and conceived of as an app, not as a text messaging service or the hybrid model of a preloaded set of educational materials. Um, so how was that challenge of, um, let's say, digital divide addressed, um, Lucy, in your experience? You know, it's amazing to hear, Dorani, that we've been through so many of these same challenges as we look at scaling throughout Africa and Asia and, and you look at scaling throughout Nigeria. And we've had exactly the same. We've had to develop both an app based version. It's an, just like yours, an offline app so that you can use it um, regardless of whether you have Wi-Fi or data, but also to develop a text message version for basic phones. We've also found actually that what um, many families really like is, a, is like a WhatsApp group. So whereas parenting programs used to be a group of people who would get together, you know, once a week for two hours in a church hall or under a tree, now they're joining a WhatsApp group and they're able to, um, to, to have a, a leader, to have a group, a, you know, a group identity and, a, and to share their challenges. And, and that's, that's um, we've, ju we've just finished a, a, a randomized trial, which has shown that it is just as effective to get the group version on, online um, through WhatsApp as it is to, um, to be in person. And, and that's, I think, a re really groundbreaking to, to see that, that you can achieve the same effects for people who can't, can't access a group. But, but I think one thing that, that we've seen and, and, and colleagues, it, it sounds like we're all seeing very similar things, is that we have to make, of course, these crucial adaptations for language, for culture, but that some of these central messages are, are so shared. You know, the, the challenges that, that you were talking about, um, about with um, making sure that people understand that um, basic basic phone safety and basic internet safety. It's very similar with, with parenting. You know, we have 50 years of evidence on, on what can help in these difficult situations. Simple ways to manage children's behavior. You know, what do you do when you're at the point where you want to scream at your children, which I think, you know, every parent recognizes um, happens often and has happened more often in the last two years. But the simple evidence-based techniques like you, you stop, you, you breathe in and out very slowly for 10 seconds. And at the end of that, the chances that you're going to hit or scream at your children are very substantially reduced. So we can teach people these really basic things which, which will help protect them and help protect their families. Um, and I think that, you know, Maria, you said, what's, the, what's this added benefit? It's that capacity, not just for scale, but for access. The people who could never have accessed these things before. And also, I think one thing that we've really seen is that working women, you know, working women don't necessarily have time to go and spend uh, two hours a week. And if you live in a rural community, that's another hour walking there and another hour walking back. That's four hours a week. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think we feel that also in, in Geneva and New York that we, we don't have um, we don't have that those large chunks of time. I was and about mothers, to say that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's a and mothers, universal uh, uh, phenomenon. Absolutely, and and it's a, and it's a women's phenomenon. And women are saying to us, 
I want to get help with my with with how to manage my children. And I want to get that at 11 o'clock at night, which is after I've put them to bed, sorted out the washing, done two hours of work, and I've got 20 minutes to myself. And that's when I want to access support. So we we can go a long way now in thinking about how we reach women with the support they need when and where they want to access it. And um, since since we're on the topic, um, I know that our focus is, of course, women, but when we're talking about parents, uh, there's obviously, in, in many cases, men involved as well in the raising of, of their children. A lot of it often falls on the women, I would say, traditionally, but we do see an increased engagement of, of fathers and male members of the family. So do you see... Um, a, an equal engagement between the two genders that, in, that engage with your with the application with the resources available or is it primarily women well it's, and i'd love to hear what other people are finding as well yeah. because what what we see globally as you say is that we see higher rates of mobile engagement and online engagement by men and often we find that, that men are happier to engage um, in these kind of very personal things that they find it easier to engage um, online than they would in an in-person group so parenting groups the world over have almost no male engagement but when they tried them in uganda in farmers groups and they introduced it as part of um, as part of uh, learning about new farming techniques they they were absolutely successful and they reduced not only violence against children but violence against their female partners and so I think we, you know, the, I mean, we don't know yet. We're still trying to test these new mobile um, applications and, and text message programs out. But the hope is that we can design versions and are designing versions already um, that, that men will, will want to use um, and, that, and that men will feel are not judging them or, or, um, or making them do something outside that, that their values. Exactly. Uh, because the, in, in such societies, there may be uh, sensitivities, I would say, around what is considered a socially acceptable male um, activity versus a female one, and then the stigma that can come with it might be a deterrent for certain uh, men to become more engaged. Uh, thank you very much, Lucy, for sharing. Uh, Deirdre, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, have you... Um, have, have you seen, obviously, uh, an equal engagement of male and female counterpart? Are your responders on the ground uh, only female, or do you work with a mix of male and female uh, responders with Salamatech? Um, thanks, uh, and thank you for all the discussion that's happened so far. It's, it's so interesting to see across different uh, thematic issues and different geographies, the, uh, the same sort of issues coming up in terms of, of uh, both the power of technology and also the absolute criticality of having it deeply, deeply localized from dialect, from issues, from, from everything. Um, so in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of the issue of uh, men engaging on, on issues that we deal with on the online gender-based violence piece, um, let me, again, maybe start with a little story, which might help contextualize it. Uh, so another one of the um, women that we have helped, uh, a young woman, let, let, let us call her Nuha. Um, she, again, had been a victim of uh, Facebook photoshopping, um, and a photo was of her was being used to blackmail her family. Our Salamatech field team on the ground, uh, the Digital Safe, Safety First Responders, went to meet with her family, but especially the father, to demonstrate the Photoshop technology to him, to say, look, this is how it works. Look, this picture is fake. So that intervention didn't actually save the woman from being divorced by her husband, it didn't get through to him, but it did have a big impact on her family who decided that they were going to be able to defend her knowing this, uh, that they would educate others and she ended up staying with them and did not you know, get driven into exile. So what that story emphasizes to get back to the question is the importance of awareness raising, um, not just building the digital safety of women and knowledge themselves, although that is critical, absolutely critical, but raising that wider family community public awareness of how some of these online harms are created and also how they need to be addressed. So that's why 
where we leverage technology here is the public awareness raising is an absolutely key pillar of what we do in this space. Um, you know, we run campaigns across in Syria and across the MENA region using a lot of local partners who amplify those messages across their own platforms and their own communities with tremendous, tremendous uptake. But the uptake isn't just uh, online. So, for example, you know, campaigns, we get 12 million user engagement which is quite incredible on some of these issues. Uh, but that has amplification effects because it gets picked up by media. Local, regional, national, newspapers, television, radios. The, the effect of these campaigns has clearly shown the extreme need for opening up space for these discussions, which is how we sort of see that online piece. It starts to open up wider spaces for all sorts of ripple effects that we can't measure or know, but we, we know concretely in terms of data, but we do know that they're happening. Um, and those discussions that we've seen starting to happen in the media and in other groups, other NGOs, other women leaders, um, is looking at those water issues as well, the community issues, men and boys in all of this, and also legal dimensions of some of these issues in some of those countries. Um, so that's sort of where we think there's a very, very important uh, component to the whole online dimension and the men engage. It's, it's, you know, it's not just a female problem, right? It, it's a full community. If we want to get to a gender transformative future, it's got to be bringing everybody along with it. So it's very, very important. And that's where technology helps you reach out into those spaces. Thank you very much. Uh, that's that's absolutely true. And um, I, from from all of the, uh, all of this, I picked up in particular the involvement of the media, right? The raising of awareness that uh, that this um, that, that this amplifying effect, as you said, can can bring. And uh, of course, in in many cases, that can be constructive, but uh, media can be a bit of a double-edged sword uh, sometimes. Um, especially when it comes to female victims of violence. I mean, we've experienced it and we've all seen uh, the backlashes or potential backlashes of the Me Too movement and so on. So I would like to um, maybe ask Morgan if there's in their work, in your work that you've done within Switzerland, if there's been uh, data findings to suggest any particular spike uh, in gender-based um, let's say, language around potential victims of, 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 of abuse, whether that be uh, real or perceived. Um, and uh, has your algorithm been able to show any trends? And is that something that you would potentially share with you know, any, any sort of organization that could make a, a difference apart from the community-based engagement? Yes, surely. Um, it's one of the aim of our uh, of our uh, project is, um, of course, to collect data on um, on language. How because um, what is maybe I did, I haven't had the chance to say it, um, yet is that we started uh, by targeting um, <clears throat> hate to get women, but now we have more. Um, we got a lot of support in Switzerland, and then we are now targeting um, every kind of discrimination online. Uh, in the, the, the hateful comment, but I, that is sure that um, our, our algorithm uh, will um, and is already uh, giving us a lot of data that uh, will be used and that are very precious um, on how women are um, affected by the feminine. Um, as we are uh, slowly starting, uh, we don't have yet um, results that I can truly share. Um, what I do know, for example, for the French part of Switzerland is that uh, women are the second uh, most targeted group, um, for example. So we do, we will um, um, know more um, about that and we will then be able as um, also um, the position we have to um, to bring that awareness to the political sphere and then uh, take action um, very based on, on the, the violence that we were um, aware to witness. Um, I'm not sure if that was... No, there. thank you. This is, this is interesting, especially when you consider Switzerland as a country where normally there's a 
a high rate of education. There's, uh, for the most part, people are reasonably financially independent women as well. Um, it may no, not be the case in uh, countries such as India, for example, or other emerging countries in, in Asia. So Sahana, I mean, did you, did you see in your experience any challenges with uh, persuading women to adopt um, the technologies and the solutions that Hand in Hand offers uh, as against current cultural social norms? Or was it um, a, a relatively easy sell, so to speak, to, to offer them this solution? How did you address this uh, potential challenge? Thanks, uh, Maria. I think uh, implementing any tech-based project in irrespective of uh, region, be it in Switzerland or Uganda or wherever it is there are, it comes with a lot of uh, cultural barriers and I think mindset barriers, uh, they don't want to approach anything that's new. I think the fellow panelists before me, be it Lucy or Help Mum, I think many of the challenges they said, even though the work we do is a little different in terms of our focus is on more financial empowerment of women, I think we faced uh, many uh, similar challenges. I'd just like to take a minute to talk a little bit more about our application. Um, so what we do at Hand in Hand is uh, we focus on job creation for women entrepreneurs at the bottom of the pyramid. And one of the challenges that we saw that emerged for these women entrepreneurs after they've created their enterprise, where they're making a product or have a service, is that they don't really have the access to market linkages for them to sell these products or services. Um, they spent a lot of time and effort. They didn't know where to look. And we really wanted to address this problem because we've helped them so far. We've helped them in forming a group, giving them access to savings, access to credit. And then now how do we help them actually get access to that market? So we solved this. We got a grant from the foundation for three years to build a mobile application and an SMS-based system. We had both because of the same problems the other panelists said in terms of, um, you know, most women have feature phones versus smartphones, but the application actually was to bring markets to rural women entrepreneurs, basically on their smartphone. And it was a business to business mobile marketplace. And we actually reached out to about 50,000 women through this application where they could trade amongst themselves. So, um, just just to give you an example of what this means, uh, there are buyers and there are sellers, all rural women entrepreneurs enrolled on this application. One lady may be working in the agriculture space, she may be harvesting wheat or rice, for instance, she may not have avenues to sell it. But there may be another lady who um, runs a bakery and she may need the wheat for her um, you know, good. So she can directly uh, connect with this other entrepreneur on this platform and uh, they figure out the logistics and the payment and they get, um, she gets the wheat that she needs. There could be another restaurant here or a small or shop owner who may want these big goods. So it's just a network that we helped facilitate and form and help them trade. So over a period of three years, when this pro uh, I think initially there was a lot of resistance because of the, um, the challenges, uh, lack of infrastructure, lack of awareness, um, uh, in India, actually, the uh, it's. I just want to say a statistic. It's quite surprising. In rural India, 57% of rural India actually has access to smartphones. Um, and I was just reading yesterday when I was looking up the statistic that Google CEO has said the next one billion are just in India that they need to tap into. So the cost of data has significantly reduced right now. The access to smartphone technology is very, uh, it's, it's up and coming. And in this situation, What's important to note is that women actually, of this 57%, rural women, only 20% of them actually have the direct access to the smartphone. Um, it's usually a shared resource. It's the husband or an elder child um, or a teenager uh, usually having the smartphone and, and not the woman herself. So we had to really uh, leverage this mobile phone as a shared resource while uh, training them on the application. Of course, we had to customize for um, language, vernacular, make it easy to use so they understand. But at the end of the three years, when there was a quasi-experimental design study that was done over a period of time with a case and a control group, and we really saw that they adapted to the mobile application, there was a 50% increase in income 
of those women in the case group versus the control group because of this access to market. And this financial empowerment, especially at the bottom of the pyramid, the women really don't spend on themselves. Uh, they spend on household decision making. They spend on educating their children, improving nutrition for their children and health of their families. So really, there was a very tangible socioeconomic impact of this project um, that we saw and uh, women save time uh, that they could spend making their product um, they did actually spend a lot of time physically marketing their product which they greatly saved and uh, the question on men in uh, you know you asked the other panelists I think I should highlight here that um, I think once the women become successful and this is beyond the application right we work with women not all of them are on the app once they become successful to a certain extent and they're bringing this additional income to the family, the men somehow realize the value and potential that the women are also contributing financially. And, and because of that, men start contributing to the enterprise. They help for marketing or uh, whatever support they can do to enhance the enterprise. And it sort of moves from like a very small business to a larger business uh, and, a, and a family sort of business. So we did face similar challenges as the uh, everybody else said, but I think we have a very robust digital literacy training uh, module, which, which we implemented uh, up front and we handheld we have to handhold them through the project, I think, and even after the project is over and keep customizing based on their needs. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much um, for for that, uh, Than. I think it's uh, as you said, it's it's really heartwarming to hear that there's generally more of a an engagement more broadly, and there's a virtuous circle event, if you will, uh, coming from the adoption of of these technologies. Because often in the media we we focus on the negatives, how it's isolationist, how it's People are becoming self-centered or have a lack of attention span because we're all on these apps. So I think it's important to be able to contextualize and see a bit of the bigger picture of how um, the adoption of online and technology can be used for good. Um, I know that we're almost up at the hour uh, and we have uh, several questions that have come in from, from the audience. I guess one last question for me before we open it up. Um, to the questions that we've received in the comments panel, as well as um, for anyone that would like to speak up after, is COVID-19, was this a, a positive impetus for the adoption of the technology in your organization or not? And uh, it can be a very brief answer. So Sahana, we'll start with you and then we'll, we'll go quickly like a fire round. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Maria. Of course, I think um, COVID-19 definitely was a positive impact in terms of uh, um, adoption of technology. As I just ended my last question, not only the application, but we realized that women needed um, a uh, another, we created another application during COVID basically to facilitate digital financial payments so women can repay their loans to microfinance institutions and that application would talk about their credit risk, future borrowing potential. This is very useful for them because they didn't have to go to a bank uh, when there was mobility issues and um, the pandemic also really helped us look into the telemedicine space. Um, so we really uh, are in very remote rural areas where women don't have access to a doctor but many of them were falling sick as men and women. So it really helped us branch off into all areas of work and bringing technology into our area of work. And also I think COVID spurred us to bring technology into our organization itself mm -hmm. as a whole. We got a digital tracking system for all our projects and fund utilization. We couldn't go to the field as much, but we still had to do our work. We had to monitor. So um, it's definitely been, uh, I think if there's one positive takeaway from COVID, it, it has to be the access um, technology has given all of us to continue our work because uh, much sooner than, I'm sure it would have happened 10 years down the line, but Absolutely. it's happened much sooner because of COVID. Yeah. Thank you. Morgan, what about you? Well, um, I don't know if you, we can say that we've been lucky, but we actually launched the training of our algorithm uh, right in the middle of the lockdown. So a lot of, of people were inside and kids train our algorithm. So that was um, it. But I think that uh, mainly, um, I think that the polit political crisis that was around, um, well, um, made um, 
this hate speech um, way worse that, as we know. Um, and I think that a lot of people witnessed that and a lot of people were um, willing to take action um, because they saw that and it was not. Um, so in that way, and I think that every political crisis um, bring that, um, but uh, in that way, yes, um, we needed solution. That was one of the solution and people could um, use it. Thank you. So thankfully, people, you know, had had a bit of spare time on their hands and were able to play <laughs> around with your your AI, with your algorithm. This is it. <laughs> Lucy, uh, what was your experience? Was COVID a, 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 an impetus catalyzer or not? You know, a billion children a year are, are victims of abuse and and the huge majority of that is not malicious parents or caregivers it's exhausted stressed overwhelmed caregivers and added on to that we have these these nine million children orphaned by by covid and i think you know we have to we have reached a point where you have to say you can't you can't just deliver small boutique interventions which reach a few hundred thousand people because although those are hugely valuable they're never going to reach when you have the scale of of this need and, and you know, I, I hear the same I hear the same stories behind the challenges in Nigeria and the and the challenges in India. The challenge is too big for for one to one provision, and and so we have to. In a way, it's it's I think it's done exactly the right thing. It's forced us to push out of a, a model um, which was never going to reach even a tiny fraction of of those who needed it. And the challenge now that we have to say is we have to get those mod the, these new remote models better and we have to make them more accessible. Um, and, you know, I was, I was interested also in thinking that there are some, some groups who are saying it is cheaper to give everyone a smartphone. Smartphones now are accessible for $15 um, in Africa and, and Asia. It may be cheaper to give someone a smartphone than to go and visit them five times with the transport costs. And so sometimes we have to now start thinking differently about how we can deliver our programs. Um, and, and I think what's also has really, this panel has really woken me up to is that in parallel, we have to be thinking about the safety of the people taking part in any online, in, in any online activity at all. And so we, we really do have a chance, I think now, to, to, um, to bring together the knowledge that we have of effective public health programs with these new opportunities of digital digital delivery but to make sure that that we that we ensure safety at the same time and if we can get that right we can really serve women globally in a way that we never have before thank you thanks lucy um, for for that um I guess from here uh, we will. I would like to stay on the African continent and go uh, to Adireni. Um, what What was your experience and your organization's experience with 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 COVID, um, and maybe building up on what your previous panelists have said? Did you Did you see this as a catalyzer? Did you see yes, more so, commitments from supporters, whether that was financial or technological, to engage? Yeah, so I would say it's a, um, possibly a, it was a blessing for us as an organization to scale and see other ways in which we can use technology to um, actually reach more people. But it, was, um, it wasn't a blessing for our beneficiaries because women were the ones that were mostly affected during COVID. A lot of them lost their jobs. A lot of them had to stay at home. And, you know, the people we reach out to are people in the rural communities. They did not have money before. Now, after COVID, most of them didn't, were now more poorer. So we decided to, from our own end, to make our solution more cheaper, then look for sponsors that can support what we do so that we can start giving out some of our products. So we give out a lot of our clean bed kits to women during the COVID time. And even we had a partnership with the Google Women team to give out um, nose masks to women in rural communities. We gave out close to like 5,000 nose masks to women in rural communities with partnership with um, giving women. So it was like a catalyst for us because that was the time we also launched our e-learning platform where we started giving out um, digital tablets that has the content of health trainees to community health workers 
and traditional bath attendants. And I will give you an instance. Before we launch our e-learning platform, we only trained, in two years, we trained 500 community health workers. When we launched our e-learning platform with free digital health mobile tablet, we were able to, under the space of one year, we were able to train 2,000, uh, 2005 community health workers because people we gave out the digital health mobile tablet to were also training more people and giving them the content. And those ones were giving other people the content. So there was a multiplier effect from that. But in terms of the beneficiaries that we serve, COVID-19 wasn't a good time for, for, for them. But we had to, on our own part, look for more people that can support our work. And from there, we were able to provide a lot of our service and product for them freely. And I just think COVID-19 was a catalyst for us to launch more initiative out and to scale our impact but it wasn't beneficial to the women and the, in the other South communities that we serve. Thank you very much. Um, are there any, uh, I think this is a, a shared, um, indeed a very shared experience. Um, and then last but not least, Deirdre, um, how did COVID-19 affect uh, your uh, organization's operations and the, how did it catalyze the adoption? or further adoption of the technology. Thank you. Yes, thanks, and, and absolutely. Um, for sure, For first of all, with so many more people being online as their only sort of link to the world at various times in various parts of the world, right? It, it, it was a shifting sort of schedule, but it really did the forcing function in terms of everybody being much more aware of their digital vulnerabilities and all of a sudden wanting to learn a lot more uh, about basic digital safeties, how to keep themselves safer online. Um, what we saw in our work with the Middle East, uh, one, of, one of the first waves actually of uh, folks, of, of females, but also males, but females really reaching out for more advice and help was amongst teachers who were all of a sudden forced on their own to do remote schooling, you know, with, with very little guidance in some places, just go go do it. And of course, even, you know, in 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 uh, in countries here, we, we heard issues of Zoom bombings and all sorts of things, uh, but it really really forced, uh, um, uh, made people a lot more engaged in terms of understanding, wanting to understand about digital safety, better practice. Same with um, offices and workers. And so we do a lot of work also with very smaller at risk organizations across the Middle East. A lot of them are female led or focused on female uh, women's rights. Uh, and when all of them were distributed home at various points in time, again, it was a forcing function because in the office, even though this isn't really true, uh, people get a false sense of protection sometimes thinking, oh, well, you know, the the, the network will do it for us. Uh, but once they were home, they realized uh, sort of every person for themselves vulnerability. So again, it, it sort of um, opened up people's interest and engagement uh, in terms of really uh, wanting to learn more and that's that's also you know that's always um super helpful uh and also it allowed us to uh further increase we we already host online hun literally hundreds of uh very um locally levelly adapted in dialects etc based basic digital resources but it opened up a whole nother round um and uh, of new resources that needed to be done in order to respond to the different sort of concerns that were now being raised but the good thing about this is that um, you know digital safety principles best practice are the same you know it, it, it's about protecting your information it's about you know uh, doing the things you can to, 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 to protect your devices your information your personal information so a lot of those basic principles uh, we were able to get out to so many more people just because they had different levels of concerns, but which also facilitated that um, objective of really empowering women more with uh, that sort of knowledge. So, um, and yes, if we distribute smartphones, please let's package it up with digital safety training. <laughs> Be great. What a great point. Thanks a lot, uh, Deirdre. I thank you to everyone, to all our panelists for uh, uh, everything that you've shared with us so far. Um, with this, I would like to open it up for, for Q&A. Um, before I do so, I would just like to maybe call out uh, one of our attendees today, uh, who is uh, Gisela Reina, 
Um, Gisela um, is a, a member of Action Aid in Switzerland and long-standing member actually of the Giving Women. And she, uh, a lot, she, I would love Gisela if you could kindly unmute yourself and maybe share with us some of the actions that uh, that you are undertaking, that the organization is undertaking in Jordan. Because as far as I understand, there's also a lot of um, of overlap in terms of what. Um, for example, SecDev and Salamatech are doing with respect to uh, to reaching local populations there through uh, through the use of technology. Yeah, thank you very much. I really love the, the discourse so far. There are a lot of interesting points, a lot of points that resonate as well with what ActionAid does in Jordan, particularly. I think just wanted to highlight a few aspects that might be useful to you know to to to. to to bring in into this. Uh, one was that we were faced with the same issue, uh, uh, difficult to reach women, especially in rural areas, especially women from refugee groups in Jordan, where there's a high level of sexual harassment, a uh, high level of uh, sexual violence, and difficult for women to get out. Well, COVID has only exacerbated this, as we all know. So one of the things we have learned was that through Instead of developing a specific application, we sat down with the women themselves um, to try to see what kind of application will be best fit their, let's say, their, their, their use. And so instead of designing something, something more specific and sleek and nice, uh, we developed a chatbot uh, on Facebook because that Facebook was the medium that most of them were using. So it was a simple application that was kind of the, 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 the development of it was really guided by the women themselves. So kind of <laughs> reduced perhaps the sleekness of it, but that was helpful in the sense of, um, uh, of reaching out. The other mm -hmm. thing was that there are a lot of services out there, not just ActionAid, but especially you know, state government services, other NGOs, UN, but they are not reaching out to these women. So instead of duplicating those services, what this application aimed to do was to create a platform. Uh, we reached out to these different services and encouraged them to uh, offer those services on the platform so that we do not duplicate, but we create a possibility for women to access those existing ones, but you know, out of reach normally. So, so, so we also then changed the design in a way of not making it more an action aid application, but to, or um, a chat but to make to have a kind of more uh, neutral name so we, it's called the uh, darb alaman i can send perhaps a, a link to it so you can see obviously in terms of 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 issues that we mm -hmm. face privacy was a big concern for women so how can it because it was also mentioned earlier uh, often they do not possess the smartphone themselves so how can they access this application in a in, in a in a private way so privacy was was number one uh, some of the concerns that we have faced so far is really, I mean, uh, uh, trying to reach out to a bigger number of, of, of services, that, that obviously, but also to illiterate women, because obviously that is not, uh, so we are trying to find ways to, to adapt it, uh, to make sure that also illiterate women can access it. And I think um, in terms of uh, gaps, uh, especially psychosocial services were missing so we added that up to the services we could be we we were offering but just uh, i just wanted to to clarify that and perhaps if there are questions happy to answer there is um, thank there's you. a thank you send a link if you if you thank like. you Zella. please feel free to share the link in the chat box for all attendees to to see and uh, people can peruse it um i was just uh, also browsing through um, the questions that have come uh, through already. Um, Morgan, there was, you mentioned actually um, earlier that women were the second highest targeted group in terms of hate speech in the areas where you've done your analysis. Which one was the first out of curiosity? So yeah, um, I, I was I was um, saying that um, we don't have like it was one of the I said second because in the last um, report I saw it was the second but we don't have um, enough um, good data now um, to tell you it, it's very specific to Geneva for now um, but I will uh, share with the group um, whenever we have the first official report. Yeah. We have very like it's for now. It's really um, linked to the most targeted um, group in in terms of discrimination, anyway. So. Right. 
but I mean, I guess if we were to delve deeper into the into the data, we would not find anything very surprising. It might be uh, in terms of uh, uh, you know race or country of origin or sexual orientation, apart from just gender, right? The, exactly. These are, I would say, across the board. Um, exactly. Find them. Um, so. I think I've done a lot of talking. We've done a lot of talking. Uh, is anyone from the audience, uh, would anyone have a question? Please feel free to raise your hand and Kathleen and I will be happy to unmute you and uh, yeah. take. So I don't see additional hands coming up, but I don't know if anybody does. Oh, yes, we have Emilia. If she wants, we can unmute. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this, um, for giving women for this panel, for this opportunity on a very important topic. And thank you all the panelists. It's been a very, very uh, important discussion today. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm following up on a previous theme that was um, at an event by giving women earlier um, end of last year, and that was on Afghanistan and the women and girls in Afghanistan. I put, put a question about it in the chat as well. I'm wondering if there's any uh, experience with the panelists of any existing programs, any future programs, or just maybe a brainstorm of how we could support women and girls in this current predicament that they are experiencing. It has, of course, been an ongoing situation with women's rights in Afghanistan for decades now, um, for a lot of us who've worked there. But specifically now with the aftermath of, of the international troops withdrawing from Afghanistan in August 2021, how we could somehow harness technology to support these women and girls. There was a thriving community upcoming uh, STEM uh, girls and, and, and young women who unfortunately many, of, well, fortunately many of them were able to find um, uh, safe security in other uh, countries and, and were able to leave. But that leaves a huge gap in that society now in terms of advancement in technology and supporting women and girls who are experiencing this kind of um, violence. So if, if there's any ideas how we could move forward, supporting them specifically on SGBV issues, but also perhaps in technology, how we could support especially their educational uh, prospects. Thank you. Thank you for the for the question, Amelia. Um, who from our panelists would like to to, to tackle this? Um, I mean, Deirdre, Lucy, Sahana, um, either of you, I think, might uh, might have potentially something to say. Sahana. Okay. Great. Yeah, I um I just want to say that Afghanistan specifically, hand in hand, India actually has uh, experience in working with Afghanistan and. The Indian team was responsible for setting up hand in hand Afghanistan um, in um, several years ago. And again, though we did not work with girls, and I know the question from the media was specifically on, on girls, uh, we do work with women over there. And uh, we have worked previously by forming self-help groups of women and um, groups of men and women both together actually and respecting all uh, Islamic laws, just uh, uh, respecting uh, the views of the land over there. Um, the situation now, of course, is quite dire, but I think uh, these women's groups still do exist. They are quite uh, suppressed. So I think technology like the application we've developed, providing them a little bit uh, uh, with all the digital safety measures that were said, but also access to uh, markets and some financial transactions uh, through mobile technology would actually really help uh, women over there. In terms, I think the same application 
um, I think they need a lot of support on ground through not-for-profits over there. If they can get access to uh, digital technology, even in terms of uh, tablets, uh, I think education modules can easily be pushed to girls over there, even if they're not uh, present in school um, and they have to do it remotely. So we also run like digital uh, satellite training centers in India. So such a concept of children still being in school when they don't have access to devices is possible. But if there is support on ground, um, I think uh, there's a local team over there and, and there's definitely a possibility to replicate these models that have been successful elsewhere. And I think the key is to work again with the community, really understand uh, their needs, which we know, but also work in a way that it will be accepted by the entire community and the government. So we really don't work against them, but work in a more enabling way. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's just a few thoughts I had. Thank you for, for sharing those. Um, uh, Lucy or Deirdre, any thoughts on your side before we move to the next question? I think Deirdre is far I, more just, an expert. Oh, uh, uh, just very, very quick, uh, going to say, uh, we ourselves, we're not, um, don't have programs in Afghanistan at the moment, but I do know uh, across the digital safety community that when all of this was happening, there was a real mobilization to try to make sure that at least resources uh, around digital safety um, uh, practice in guides, in local language guides, there was a real movement like with Access Now and some of these bigger players to make sure that some of that information uh, got out there. Um, and I, I do know just from our work in Syria that for women, uh, an absolutely critical need in that kind of very um, unsettled environment is the ability and knowledge to actually erase your cell phone history, your social media platform, uh, because quite often what we found in Syria, there will, there, you know, you could have had a very innocent sounding Facebook conversation with somebody uh, that all of a sudden becomes very dangerous in a different political environment or in a different uh, military environment. So um, I'm not actually sure what whether the groups that were helping there were actively, I know they gave guidance on that. I don't know if they were actively helping women do that and that act of support is absolutely essential uh, because it's fine to have some written guidance but it's it's not the same at all as having somebody there on the end of a some sort of communication line helping you walk through it so yeah can i just sorry jump in i would um the the need also in a way sexual gender well gender-based violence is lack of access to school and education now yes. And especially in the context of Afghanistan, I would argue. And therefore, um, I have heard about schools that are being run online for women who have not been able to attend school since September, or girls specifically who have not been able to attend um, education since September. And maybe that is something also to look for in this community and, and link up with organizations or donors who are interested in, in providing that um, stealth education that is at the moment the only way to get girls educated in Afghanistan. So thank you very much for all your responses and do a great work. Thank you, Emilia. Um, Atalanta, I saw you had your hand raised, uh, but uh, you perhaps your question was answered. So I'll come to you after our other attendees. We've got um, Gufta. Gufta, would you like to in Afghanistan. ask our questions? Yeah. I'm just asking to there you go. please unmute yourself okay thank you so much uh, uh, and thank you uh, giving women for this interesting discussion and um, my question is you know um, i've been working with action for development and we are working uh, for afghanistan and the women and uh, girls and uh, there everybody we are talking about tech we are talking about online but uh, the internet facility is a big issue there. Whenever we are doing something, there is a, a problem with the internet. The, there is not a, a continuous supply of inter internet and there is a difficulty. Even we faced uh, uh, in one of our studies we were doing over there and uh, one whole day there were no internet. So we were really out of touch and we had to figure out how to do it and we had to reschedule the program. So if we are thinking about educating or online platform or e-learning, 
for the girls, which we are also thinking because they are in need of that. But the internet facility is a big issue. So if we could uh, find out uh, um, uh, through this platform, any way we can make that better. I don't know, I'm not a tech person. So that would be very helpful. And uh, I'll be looking for that kind of information from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Shagufta. I think that's a, that's a great point, um, bringing up that the internet or data penetration, I would say, in remote areas is uh, one of the uh, issues that are, a lot of tech companies are looking to address. Um, and uh, even if you think about uh, the very well-known ones or renowned ones such as SpaceX, they're looking to see how they can potentially launch uh, internet via satellite coverage so that essentially the entire world might be covered through a web of satellite based internet which will be available at a very low cost uh, and there's been a recent partnership announced with India with the Indian government on that on that front um, between Elon Musk and uh, and the Indian government let's see where that leads but there it is for sure a concern and uh, we recognize that it's a hurdle um, so I'm sure that uh, as technology advances, these issues should diminish, but they are for now a very real barrier to entry sometimes. Um, thank you. Uh, I don't know if any of the panelists have any insights with their experience and how they addressed it more concretely. Yeah, yeah just a quick one also. Um, so we were faced with this problem when we launched our e-learning platform. And like I said, so the best way to do this is project when you want to launch a, a technological project for people in on the sub area, always have that at the back of your mind that it is capital intensive. And what I mean by it is capital intensive is that you have to facilitate the infrastructure for them. So what I mean by that is that you, you have to provide a mobile tablet. And the best way to do that is that you can't provide everybody a mobile tablet, right? You can provide some of the high network people in those community a mobile tablet, people that people listen to. So you can look for like the head of a maybe head of a community within our community that people listen to. Provide that with the um, with the mobile tablet. Load the content of your technological solution on the mobile tablet that they can have access to it without internet. Then give it to people like that. Then people like that can go to their community to train others with those content. So we've seen that with that way we've been able to scale faster because at the end of the day you can't give everybody a mobile tablet in the community just look for people that are high network in that community to go on and train other people in the community the other ways you can do do this also is that when you use this first methodology and you have good results to show you can go meet high network partners that can fund the infrastructure fund the mobile tablet or even speak with the manufacturers of the mobile tablet that we did this, we did a pilot of this project, giving out your mobile tablet to people in this community. This was the impact. Now imagine we giving out more mobile tablets with your name to those people in the community, the kind of impact that will happen. So these are the ways you can approach it and go about things in that way. Thanks a lot, um, uh, Adirani. Um, just Maria, can time. I just add a, sure. one point to that, if you don't mind? Just Absolutely. following up just on what you said. That we have from five minutes, so if you just one, speak. just one minute to just add, because um, I think the point um, Adirani made was very valid. We also did. Uh, we work in areas where there's absolutely no internet connection, uh, and we had a partner which was a, a renowned software company. And there's a solution. Uh, so not all of places like Afghanistan. There will be places that have connection to the internet and there can be a centralized server in that particular place and in that place you can keep pushing data into that server that will simultaneously keep the data in real time in the respective tablets even if those tablets don't have access to um, internet connection in the remote rural areas so that is definitely a, a possibility if that's something uh, you're exploring and uh, we have partnered with an organization that helps us do that to reach like really the unreached with access to data and um, information. So centralized server pushing the data is definitely an option. Thanks. Thanks, Ahana. I just wanted to say uh, that we're almost at the cutoff time of 1.30. Of course, if members and participants wish to stay and have the time to stay on a bit longer for to conclude the session with additional questions, we can, we can uh, accommodate. Maybe the last question that we'll take is from Sarah. Um, if you could please unmute yourself so that 
There you go. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just have a question for Lucy. I'm just interested in um, when she says that uh, uh, as a billion children are uh, being abused by their parents. Um, for me, uh, and the male population is, is one of the main target groups. Once you provide the technology to these families, how do you actually get the male um, to participate? Because I think this is maybe half of the problem is the target group, are they engaging and participating once the technology has been given to them? As you previously said, it was uh, the women that were going on at 11 o'clock in the evening to try to find the help. Do, do you also find this coming from the male group? You know what, Sarah, you've highlighted, I think, one of the major new questions in child protection and in violence prevention against uh, children. And this is going to be the, one of the major things that we're going to be working on over the next um, few years. Um, and I think it's not just about violence against children, but it's about violence in the family. So intimate partner violence and domestic violence. And, and this, is, this is a challenge, we have to crack this. And, and we also know that, that violence increases with mental health distress, with unemployment, with poverty, and those are all going to become worse over the next um, few years because of the, the massive impacts of a global pandemic. So it's not, just, it's not just an important research question, it's an absolutely fundamental question we have to crack. Ask me again in two years time. Great, so we have a date for the next panel then, <laughs> latest in two years. Um, thank you, Lucy. Um, I guess that we're almost at time and if there aren't any further questions, Atalanti, would you like to make any closing comments before I, I close off the session or is there anything else that needs to be addressed? I'd just like to say that this has been absolutely, it, it, so I've learned so much. It's made me think about things and how we should be dealing with issues in a very, very different way. It's been a real eye opener talking about, I love the expression that technology is a catalyst to scale. But at the same time, uh, what I really loved about all the, all the panelists is it was so personal. It was like, we're touching individual human beings who are having a hard time in using technology in a very personal way. So really a lot of food for thought for all of us and a way that we can, I Help Month started as a very small project and thanks to technology, it's grown much bigger. And so <clears throat> thank you everybody, this has been brilliant. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Atalanti. Um, I, th I would like to thank all of all of the participants today, in particular our amazing panel, and encourage uh, any one of the participants who would like to engage further on the topic to feel free to reach out uh, to myself or to Kathleen or to Atalanti or to any of, of the participants, and we can put you in touch with the panelists should you wish to continue the discussion offline. Uh, we're always very happy to do that. And uh, perhaps to conclude, I was thinking about interesting quotes regarding technology and humanity, because that was making what this whole session made me think about. And there was a famous quote by Einstein where he allegedly said that it become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. Well, I would like to flip that on its head. And I would say that today has proven that it's abundantly obvious that our humanity can be enhanced by the use of technology. And uh, I would say our panelists and your amazing work is proof of that. And we can't wait to see what, what else is coming in future. So thank you all. Thanks for being a very engaged and uh, interested panel and audience. And uh, I look forward to hearing and to seeing you in one of our future sessions. Thanks a lot.